Hi everyone and welcome to Classic Register's overview of the Studebaker Daytona of 1964. Now I've been wanting to put together a video on these cars for a long time with the aim to complement our written information guide for the 64 Daytona that we have on ClassicRegister.com. The Studebaker Daytona from 1964 was something a little bit different and in terms of early muscle cars it's a personal favourite of mine. Now this video is designed for enthusiasts who are interested in the cars but also for people who are maybe looking at getting into something a bit more unique outside of the standard Ford, GM and Mopar cars. So in this video we look at some of the features of the Studebaker Daytona from 1964 including some of the design, performance and even promotional aspects as well as some of its film appearances. And we're also going to have a look at some of the specific features of the Studebaker Daytona in a small collection here near Sydney, Australia. The 64 Daytona was a trim level offered in the Studebaker range for that year alongside the Challenger, Commander and Cruiser models. There are a couple of reasons that I'm focusing on the Daytona as a distinct model within that range and it's partly because I have access to this small collection near Sydney, Australia which we're going to have a closer look at, but it's also because two of the most distinct or desirable and rare body styles are actually available exclusively to the Daytona model and that includes the hardtop, the pillarless hardtop, as well as the convertible. The pillarless hardtop and convertible weren't available on any other model in the Lark replacement range for the 1964 year, so they're exclusive to the Daytona model. Now for 1964, there are around 11,000 Daytonas produced in all body styles, and that includes the four-door sedan, the wagon, the pillarless hardtop and the convertible. The Daytona was never available in the two-door sedan pillared coupe format. It was only available in the two-door pillarless hardtop. With around 11,000 units built throughout all body styles in the Daytona range, this in itself is already a relatively rare car, but then when you look at the production numbers, particularly of the pillarless hardtop and the convertible, those are exceptionally rare cars by today's standards. The Daytona model and others in the Studebaker range at the time were designed to compete in the compact saloon market at the time, which was becoming increasingly overcrowded with the likes of the Ford Falcon, the Plymouth Valiant, Chevy Corvair, Chevy Nova, Buick Special, among many others at the time. This overcrowded market made it very difficult for Studebaker to compete, particularly considering it was one of the smaller manufacturers in the area. One of the reasons I really like this particular era of Studebaker is because they were very early in dabbling in the compact performance saloon market. For example, the offering of the R-Series engines in the 1963 Daytonas and the Super Larks and the supercharging of those engines and things was something that a lot of competitors were offering but in much larger packages. And Studebaker in 1963 started this new sort of trend with smaller, more compact muscle cars, which later really took off with the likes of the Ford Mustang. Most other manufacturers by the mid-60s, of course, had performance options on their small, compact muscle cars, but I think Studebaker was a bit ahead of the curve, particularly in 1963, offering these performance packages, which, of course, came through and were available on the 1964 models as well. And at the time as well, Studebaker went to big efforts to try and publicise or promote the performance nature of its brand, which it hadn't really done to, to such an extent in earlier years. Being one of the first companies to have its own proving grounds, Studebaker was in a good position to be able to showcase what its cars were capable of, but it went a step further in 1964 by bringing its cars to the Bonneville Salt Flats in order to further enhance its performance image. All of this, of course, was designed to try and appeal to more buyers, and particularly to try and appeal to younger buyers in the market. Now, with this performance image in mind, you would think that perhaps Studebaker would have considered backing a factory team in touring car racing. But by this time, Studebaker was dealing with serious financial issues, and I doubt that a factory-backed race team in any form would be considered by the board. Now, that's where I think there's also some lost potential for the cars. If they had had the backing that Ford and GM and others had at the time, there's a lot of potential for these cars, particularly given that they were so advanced in the compact muscle car area. Despite not having a factory-backed team, Studebakers were relatively successful in racing around the world. Now, from my experience in Australia, there were privateer teams who took on these 64 model cars and raced them successfully at Mount Panorama in Bathurst, for example, and many other touring car races around the country. 
Now they didn't use Daytonas specifically in Australia, but they did use Commanders and Cruisers, and they were quite successful. I've no doubt that around the world there would have been other examples of the 64 Studebakers racing, and perhaps even Daytona models in particular. But apart from this, and despite the lack of factory backing at the time, a great cause for celebration recently was the St Mary's Trophy in 2020, which saw a Studebaker Daytona hardtop take out race two of the St Mary's Trophy. Now the field was very competitive. There were two Ford Galaxies, there were a bunch of Mini Cooper S's, there were Ford Cortinas, there were Alphas, there were BMWs, and the Studebaker was the class of the field. Now I understand I've read a little bit about that particular Daytona hardtop which you can see on screen now and apparently it's got a 283 Chev which was the motor that was applied to the 1965 Daytonas and apparently it has a Mustang rear end as well so the rear diff and suspension is apparently Mustang but the rest of it is genuine Studebaker. It's causing a bit of a stir over in Europe because a lot of people don't know what this car is. There weren't many of them exported over there. There were a few, uh, but most people haven't seen them before. And they're surprised when they're seeing this group of touring car racing being dominated by a car that's from left of field. And that brings me to my next point as to why I like these cars so much. They really are the best looking car on the track there when you look at their competitors. These cars, particularly in their convertible and hardtop form, look really good for their time. The designer Brooks Stevens did a really amazing job of squaring up the previous Lark model and turning it into something that is mid to late 60s in design and I think it's quite advanced looking for something that came out in 1964. Having a look at two of the best body styles I think are available in the Daytona range, the hardtop and the convertible. These two body styles were fairly heavily marketed by Studebaker and had their own ads as distinct from the rest of the Studebaker range. The hardtop advertisement focused on emphasising the engineering advancements made by the cars such as the availability of Studebaker's own air conditioning, twin circuit brakes, disc brakes and the handsome new look. The convertible advertisement by contrast is all about vacation, road trips, beach going and golf playing, but emphasises the armor guard chassis design as they call it, and the availability of the Avanti engines. So these particular models really did focus on the performance aspects of the cars and the unique features available with them. I would love to be able to say that the Studebaker Daytona is prominent in film, but its appearances unfortunately are few and far between. Strangely, the Daytona convertible found itself as the main star of a 1971 French film, Valparaiso, Valparaiso. So I've put together the main clips from that film for your enjoyment here. It looks to be a Canadian built car finished in golden sand metallic paint. I managed to purchase and watch the film for 4 euros on a strange French film site and it wasn't easy to track down. It is a car that's used extensively in the movie including in a small police chase scene in which the tiny French police van stood no chance chasing down the studie. I do wonder what happened to the car. There can't have been many of the 700 odd convertibles built that made their way to Europe. I know of one other recently, a Strato blue car that was advertised in Sweden about five years ago, but I haven't ever seen another in Europe. And here's the end of that cool little chase scene through the French city in that movie. Other than that, the Daytonas also appeared in sedan form regularly in a series called Wonderfalls, which is from 2004. Now this was a one season show and I haven't watched it extensively, but I've extracted a few interesting clips here from it. Now the International Movie Car Database has some comments about whether this was a 64 or 65 Daytona, but the argument's been settled and it is a 64 with a few modifications. And here's one of the favorite scenes that I found of the Daytona sedan going a little bit crazy on the streets. Beyond that, there's a small appearance in the film Mandela, A Long Walk to Freedom, remembering that several countries, including South Africa, received the 64 Studebakers in complete knockdown kits. Other than that, there are plenty of other support and background vehicle roles that the Studebaker Daytona has played. The example on screen now is an episode of Mr. Ed. We'll move on now to a more detailed overview of the Daytona's features and this is an overview of the collection of Daytona's that I've been able to get access to. We're here near Sydney, Australia having a look at a small collection of Studebaker Daytona's from the 1964 
and 1965 years. Now Australia received knockdown kits for the Commander and the Cruisers and they were quite a popular car here in Australia but all of the cars in this shed have been imported from either the US or Canada and we have with us a convertible, a hardtop and a sedan down the back as well as a 65 two-door sedan next to this. Two of the best looking body styles were available exclusively to the Studebaker Daytona and that included the convertible and the hardtop pillarless, both examples of which we have here today. So 1964 was the final year for Studebaker convertible production and there were just 702 of these cars built in the convertible form, 55 in six cylinder and the rest all in V8. Now this car has been upgraded aftermarket to an R1 engine specification. And here on the front of the car is an example of that R1 badge. Now this convertible is in great restored condition, but it is missing a few original features, such as the parallelogram badge on the front fender, or if you're doing the R1 badging correctly, it should have an oval R1 badge in place of the parallelogram badge on the fender. And it's also missing the Studebaker lettering on the trunk lid. The trunk lid currently looks like a 65 model lid. Overall though, there's not much required to bring this car back to factory specification. Having a look at some of the unique features of the Daytona, in terms of the trim on the body. The side trim here has a thick black stripe through the middle. For 64, that was applied to the Daytona. The Cruiser model had, a, had the same strip, but the outside edge was black, or the, these outer strip edges were black instead, just to differentiate it. You've obviously got the Daytona badging on the front edge of the guard, and the full width trims, wheel trims, which were also applied to the Cruiser model. Having a look at the side of this project car here, and this Daytona badge is missing here at the front. You've got the trim, which is a bit worn in the middle where the black stripe should be. Now, all V8 models, unless they were a Vanti powered or R powered cars, had this parallelogram um, badge on the side with eight on it. Uh, the six cylinder models obviously didn't have that in the Daytona, but there are very few Daytona six cylinder models. And here's a close up shot of that parallelogram eight badge. Coming down the side of the car here, and side view mirrors were optional depending on the state or required depending on the state in the US, I suppose, of where you were. And commonly applied were what's called a strato line mirror, and I believe that was a round mirror, potentially similar or the same as that, I'm not quite sure. But this is, as I mentioned, the hard top with a different trim down the bottom to the two door car. On the rear pillar, the V8 Daytonas, except for the convertibles and wagons, had a checkered flag emblem, and there were two different styles applied. One is what you see here, the simple crossed checkered flags. This simpler emblem was applied to the Canadian built Daytonas, and this car is one of just 657 V8 Canadian built hardtops. The other type of badge was applied to the South Bend built cars, and we'll have a look in a second at the sedan at the back of the shed, which has that different badge. Having a look at this sedan, this is a two-tone paint job that's been done by someone in the past. It's not an original paint job, but still looks quite good. Again, the Daytona badging, the large black stripe in the middle of the trim. So here's an example of the other badge that was applied to the South Bend built cars. As you can see, this badge has the V8 also integrated into the badge with the checkered flags. So slightly different to the badge we looked at earlier, which had just the checkered flags on their own applied to the Canadian built cars. Another feature of the 64 Daytona model is the Studebaker lettering across the back and this top trim here. In 65 they lost the top trim and the lettering to give it I guess a bit of a cleaner back look uh, but the 64 models all had the Studebaker lettering. On the convertible over there it's missing that so that's to bring it back to original it would need to look the same as this. Another option available on the Daytona and other models in the range were these rear guard stone chip guards. And these were available on the hardtop convertible and the sedan. I don't believe they're available on the wagon air though. That was the only model that you couldn't apply those to, but it's an extra trim piece that you can put on your Daytona, which is a factory original option. One of the best features about the 1964 model Daytonas is its availability in two-door hardtop as opposed to the later 65 and 66 models which had two-door sedans with a fixed pillar. And this means that you can wind down the window 
and have the whole side of the car opened up as if you were in a car with a convertible top and the windows down. Brooks Stevens did a great job of squaring up the car to make it really something that belonged in the mid to late 60s. And the car was introduced or started production in late 63, these particular cars. And you can see the design here and the way they're squared off the edge of the roof really nice with a good C-pillar design. Uh, this model as well, as you come down here, you can see it has its optional stone chip guard as well, which was what we were looking at on the sedan earlier. And it's eight slot wheel trims. Those are actually on Ford wheels at the moment, uh, the Studebaker wheels. We've got the details of those on the website. So by contrast here, looking at a 65 two-door sports sedan Daytona, you can see the difference in the side trim. They actually use the 64 Cruiser style side trim. Same Daytona badge, same wheel trims. You've got the same parallelogram eight symbol for the V8 cars. But of course, where the big difference is with the two-door version here, they stopped the hard top. So you've got a B pillar now. It still looks good, but of course it doesn't look as good as a car that can have all of the side windows down. But I'll show you how it looks once this back window comes down, just so you can see the difference. So the glass just sits in there as a separate piece. There's no frame that comes in with the glass. And this B pillar is obviously part of the car. And in the 65 year, they offered a vinyl top in either black or white. So the 65 model is in many ways very similar to the 64, and I think 65 had some really great and unique color offerings, which looked really nice with a contrasting vinyl roof. But the purists tend to be a bit more interested in the 64 models, particularly in hardtop and convertible form, remembering of course that from 1965, Studebaker started using Chevrolet engines in place of the Studebaker units. So the overall dashboard design in the Daytona or this range of vehicles, including the Daytona at the time, wasn't all that different to the 63 model. Uh, the design overall was fairly symmetrical and square and quite stylish for the time and the trim in these cars uh, was matched to the dashboard and available in a variety of colours. One thing I must say about the dashboard design is that it's fairly timeless and that's partly because of that simple straight line square design that they applied. And the instrument cluster is a simple three large gauge design, easy to read, easy to use and looks great. One feature that was standard on the Daytona in the glove box and very popular feature was the vanity mirror that comes out. So that was standard on the Daytona, I believe also on the Cruiser, but not necessarily on lower models unless it was optioned. Another way to easily distinguish a South Bend car from a Canadian car is the steering wheel. You can see on this South Bend sedan that its wheel is two-tone and it's got white with the matching trim colour applied. Now these two-tone wheels were only fitted to the South Bend built cars. By contrast, Canadian built Studebakers instead had the wheel in a single colour, which you can see is applied to the Canadian hardtop, which we're showing on screen now. So we're in the trunk of the hardtop Studio Baker Daytona here where its original dashboard is sitting just so we can show you how that was laid out. Now this particular car was a Canadian built Daytona hardtop and someone's fitted a little fuel gauge within the middle of the Studio Baker of Canada um, surround here. Often that could that would be a clock in this position or a tachometer if you had that optioned. Uh, here's an example of the clock that is usually fitted to that spot. There were a huge variety of trim colours and combinations available on the Daytona model, including vinyl and cloth materials. We've only got a small sample of colours in this collection, including brown on the sedan, red in the hardtop and black in the convertible. For full details of the colour options, do check out the link to Classic Register's Daytona Information Guide, which is in the description of this video below, and go to the interior colour and trim section of the guide, which sets all of that out for you.
The door card design was also unique for the 1964 year, and the design applied to the Daytona was different to the other door card trims in the 64 range. It had the Studebaker emblem at the top of the card, with two distinct chromium lines that ran across the card and dropped below the armrest, and then back up, linking nicely with the lower section of the dashboard when the door is closed. I think the Daytona's design is probably the nicest in the range, with the perfect amount of detail. By contrast, the 65 model was quite different, most notably in the seat trim. So the 65 cars had a buttoned or tufted seat trim material as opposed to the rigid lines of the 64 Daytonas, and the door cards were again redesigned to distinguish it for the 65 year. Taking a look under the hood now of this R1 convertible, and as you can see, there's a lot of chrome. The R1 and R2 engines were fitted with chrome features, including the valve cover and the oil dipstick handle and things, but I think the person who restored this car went a bit further with the chroming, extending it to some additional brackets and even the alternator body. This is a 289 cubic inch engine, and to identify it, you need to look at the flat area at the top of the block, where you'll see a stamped code. The 289 engines from 1964 had a code that started with P, an example of which you can see on screen now. By contrast, the standard non-R engines, unless they were fitted with an optional engine dress-up kit, were fitted with yellow rocker covers, and most other parts were finished in a simple matte black. The orange air filter on this car is aftermarket, uh, but you can clearly see the yellow rocker covers. The 259 cubic inch engines of 1964 had an engine code stamped in the same position as the 289, however that code started with V, which you can see on screen. Unfortunately we don't have an example of the six cylinder Daytona engines here, but check out ClassicRegister.com for those examples. And here we have the 65 Daytona with its factory Chevy 283 cubic inch engine. For the 1965 year, you can see they tried to keep it looking Studebaker despite sourcing their engines from Chevy. The yellow rocket covers give it away, and they also had a sticker on them which read Studebaker Thunderbolt V8. Now for 1966, they decided to paint those rocket covers black. The serial number for a 1964 Studebaker Daytona is stamped into a small metal plate which is riveted to the left side A pillar. It sits between the front left door hinges. The serial numbers are divided into first and second series cars, and we go through the identification of this in greater detail on the website classicregister.com. See the link below in the description. You'll also have a body tag number which is attached to the right front bulkhead, and again it differs between the Series 1 and Series 2 Daytonas. This was different to the 65 models again, which we're giving an example of in this video as well and we've got a guide for the 65 model on ClassicRegister.com as well. Now I won't go through the details of the Series 1 and the Series 2 cars and the differences between the numbers on the video here. I'll let you check that out at the website in the link below if you want further details about identifying your Daytona. That's everything for this video. For more information on the Studebaker Daytona models of 64, 65 and 66, check out the links below to ClassicRegister.com and also take a look at all the cars we have on the register there. We've got quite a few Daytona hardtops and convertibles, as well as a few others from 65 and 66. Thanks for watching.